Hey guys, uh, first and foremost, thanks again for coaching with us this season. I wanted to put out a, a detailed ex, uh, expectation video for you guys so you can hear it right from me. Um, this will take the place of any sort of pre-season meeting, any sort of pre-season coaching, uh, training, or anything like that. All of that is going to be what's included in this video right here. Um, so please take the time to watch it through in its entirety, um, knowing that obviously we won't have you come back for a uh, a meeting at the facility or anything like that where we have to go all over all of this in person I'd rather get it to you so you can do it on your own time but um, please make sure that you um, that you take the time to watch it and understand it and I, I welcome any questions afterwards that you have um, some of it I'll touch on a little bit knowing that there's more to it than that like our base running expectations things like that we don't have time to go over it in, in entirety so I'll just touch on it a little bit And if you have any follow-up questions that you want to learn more about um, please do ask um, at the end of this video. So I'm going to dive right into it. Um, the first thing is, and if this is the only thing you took from this entire uh, video, this would be the, the most important thing um, by far, because I think that, that everything else as far as, um, as far as what we do can be, can be overcome, but we can't overcome it. Uh, we can't overcome things like lack of energy, um, things like that. So the number one thing, head coaches and assistant coaches both, that we have to go over is making sure that at all times when you're at the field playing in games regardless of how it's going you're up big down big close situation whatever it is a ton of positivity a ton of energy and a ton of teaching at all times um, this is an absolute non-negotiable non-negotiable expectation of ours if you do fail in this area um, we will have to probably move on from you because it's become a, a staple of what we do and to be honest, I think I've, we've hired everybody for this season knowing that that's not going to be a problem for anybody here. But just know that um, in, in case it wasn't obvious or in case it needs to be said, constant positivity, constant energy, constant teaching. You're going to be in situations where you're going to win games. You're going to be in situations where you get blown out. You're going to be in situations where you lose heartbreaking games and you win thrilling games and everything in between on that spectrum. At no point in time in any of that, does your positivity, energy, and teaching stop at any point in time? And I hope that you guys understand how important that is to us. Um, and ultimately, that will give a sense to the players that we care a lot about them. Um, we care about their development. We care about them personal, uh, personally. And to the parents as well of those kids, if they can constantly see that and feel that from you, they will know um, how important it is uh, to us um, that, that their, their son, their athlete, has a great experience here. So... Um, again, if that's the only thing you took from this video, just know that that's, that's the most important thing to us. A couple of examples of how to show that, obviously, you know, and this goes all the way up through the high school ages. Um, they're coming off the field, whether it was a great one, two, three inning or an inning where they made multiple errors. If you have things that you need to uh, talk about, go ahead and do it. But you're out, you know, almost on the baseline, high-fiving guys as they come off the field and, and demanding that no matter what, they start, they bring energy into the dugout with them when they go hit. Okay, so like nice job, nice job, high five, high five. Every single player that comes in, that's a great way to show that. Uh, being really vocal, being really energetic, um, and showing them that, hey, we're engaged in this thing. I don't care if that was a one, two, three inning or we made five errors in the field. Hopefully we have more of the one, two, threes than the five errors. But regardless, we're showing positivity, energy. And then, of course, if it, is, if it was a rough inning and you have things you want to talk about, like, hey, Second baseman, you didn't cover the base when we had a double play opportunity. Stuff like that, of course, you need to, to that goes to the teaching part now. you got to teach and show them that you um, are trying to make them better at baseball as well. So it's not just about, hey, you're doing great. Well, no, you made two mistakes, and let's talk about those things. But at the end of it, I can't wait to watch you succeed next time um, because I know that you will, and that's, that's kind of the constant message that goes on over and over and over again. So please take that seriously and take that to heart, and hopefully that – you understand how important that is to us. Um, next thing that will just kind of be a, a, a basic uh, question or, or expectation that we have is, is the playing time expectations. Of course, on every single team, there's going to be a top end of your roster and a bottom end of your roster, even if they're all talented or they're all you know trying to find their way in baseball, whatever it is, you'll have a top end and you'll have a bottom end. You do not need to build a lineup as far as one through whatever that gives everybody equal time at certain parts of the lineup. You do not need to do that. What you do need to do is make sure that there's no, and we'll, I'll, I'll show you the sheet here in a second, but nobody sits you know, a, a bunch more than everybody else. 
Everybody else gets roughly equal playing time. Nobody sits more than two innings in a row. Okay, so um, the sheet that we have that you, you guys will all get this with your folder. But this is your lineup, one through whatever, how many guys, however many guys you have that day. This is the first inning, second inning, third inning, fourth inning, you know, all the way on and on and on. Usually before the game, um, the night before or the morning of, whatever, I'll write this out and I'll write like the first three innings because you can kind of say, okay, so I'm hoping that my pitcher at least gives me three. So whoever that is, you can write the pitcher and then everything else you can kind of fill in. So um, if you have 11 guys at the field with you that day, obviously two guys are on the bench while well, nine guys are out on the field, but it's not the same two guys on the bench for all three of those innings. The guy that sits the first plays the second and third at whatever position he plays. And then, you know, the uh, two new guys sit in the second inning, two new guys sit in the third inning, and by the time the game is done, you'll have some guys that sit have sat two total innings and some guys that have sat only one. Um, I know I personally, if whoever's catching that day probably doesn't sit um, so that they can there can be some continuity there. So that's the one position that it's like you don't need to worry about, okay, that guy has to sit an inning. If it's the catcher and you want to have that catcher catch the whole time, go ahead and do that, no problem. Um, another easy way to kind of keep this in check would be if you have really scheduled pitching, a pitcher will sit the inning before he pitches and the inning after he pitches. No matter what, the pitcher should sit the inning after he pitches. Um, in my opinion, that just makes it an easy way to say, okay, that guy knows as soon as he comes out of the game, he's sitting the next inning, and then we get him right back in the field the inning after that. Obviously, if you have nine guys at the field that day, which hopefully it you have at least 10 most of your games, but if you do have nine guys at the field that day, you're moving guys around, um, you're allowing them to play different positions. You do not need to compromise your ability to win games when you do this, um, but you do have, then you can strategically, you have to strategically then plan out, okay, when is maybe my best shortstop going to sit? Because inevitably, if you have one stud shortstop, he can't play the whole time, somebody else has gotta get some time there. Um, and, and on and on and on we go. So hopefully that makes sense about what uh, what our playing time expectations are. I know that um, if it was all about just winning games constantly, we know that we would build lineups different than that. High school coaches, when they get you know into playing high school games, spring high school games or college coaches or whatever, that looks much different. You don't have to have equal playing time. You play the best nine guys, and that whoever can lock down the shortstop position, that's who plays it every single time. It's different here. Okay, the families have an expectation about what this will look like for, for them. Um, and hopefully they do understand. They have some self-awareness of like, hey, my kid is really not an infielder. He wants to play infield, but we got five guys that are better at shortstop than him. He might not get too much time there. That, hopefully there's some self-awareness there. Um, but for the most part, you know, make sure that everybody gets some time at what they consider to be you know, their two to three top positions that they play because they're trying to develop this fall at those areas so they can move on to the next season with us or the next spring season or whatever it might be so that's our playing time expectations again you do not have to build a lineup that's reflective of okay he hit seventh one game that means he's got to hit second the next game you don't have to do that but defensively nobody sits you know a ton more than everybody else we kind of move things around um, and making sure that that everybody's in a comfortable position where they're staying engaged, um, staying engaged constantly. So that's the playing time expectations. Pitching expectations. Um, this one is uh, a really important one also, obviously, for the health of, of athletes. Um, I, I struggle to put a number on it. I don't think there is a correct number of pitches that any pitcher, you know, depending on the age, should be staying under. I do know this, regardless of how old they are, 100 is too much. Um, if they're a 10 to 14 year old player, 80 is probably the max and it might be too much. But again, I struggle to say that because if he threw 30 in the first and 22 in the second, well, he's at, he's only at 55. Well, yeah, but that, that 55 is way different than 55 spread over four innings, the arm health the up and down the pace of what he's doing, that the health of that and the safety of that, those are two very different numbers. 52 after two and 52 after four is way different. 52 after four, cool, send them out there for the fifth. 52 after two, you gotta start thinking about whether or not it's safe to put that athlete back out there. And I, we do trust your feel and trust your judgment, 
but I don't ever want to get into a situation where uh, whether the parent brings it to our attention or we notice it on Game Changer or whatever, where it's like he threw 103 pitches and then we call you and you're like, yeah, but we were trying to win. Yeah, don't care as much as the health and safety of the athlete. So um, hopefully you do understand that, that we care much more about the health and safety of our pitchers than we do about, yeah, but it was the semifinal game and we were trying to win. We'll deal with the repercussions of losing a lot easier than we will deal with the repercussions of we have an elbow in injury because of overuse. And to be honest, that's one of the main things that a lot of families have said that they enjoy about the club situation or coming back to us specifically is that maybe over the summer, depending on the coach, not all the coaches obviously, but depending on the coach or maybe over the summer in their associations, they were kind of abused a little bit. You know, the coach felt the pressure from the parents and wanted to win. And so, yeah, he pitched 70 pitches on Friday and came back for three more innings on Sunday. Like, that's just not safe and appropriate. So um, please make sure that you're monitoring the health of your athletes and being really, really smart. And if you're ever in a situation where you're like, I'm not sure one way or another, um, always err on the side of let's get them out of there, get somebody else in, even if that means that Hey, hopefully it doesn't happen, but you lose the game because of it. Cool. We'll, we'll deal with it. Um, over the long term, it's not going to happen enough to make it say that we're going to lose all the time because of it. Um, but we will keep our athletes safe over a long period of time. And that's really, really important to us. Um, base running expectations that we have. So this one's one, like I said, I'll just touch on it a little bit, but we don't have enough time in this video to expand on it as much as it probably deserves. Just know this, we have separated ourselves as an academy from other clubs, both in the state and out of the state, by how aggressive we are on the base paths. And it's not just for fast players. We are very, very aggressive in putting pressure on the other team constantly. At first and at second, when we steal, if the pitcher is you know, quick, to the, quick to home and the catcher's got a good turnaround pop time, we're going to need to move before the pitcher moves. Okay, and there's, it's more elaborate than that, and, it, and hopefully you've seen it, whether you've seen it because you've been with us or you've seen it because you've been at a practice um, before you play your first game and you've seen it done. Either way, um, we hope that, that you know, maybe at some point in time you're a little bit familiar with what we're talking about. If the pitcher comes set and he's going on U, C, L, and goes every single time, well, that means that the player jumps it on U, C, jump, Pitcher picks up on L, we hit the jump, and we go to second base. That's kind of the basic, um, really quick version of what we do. And then at second base, there's like max distances that we're trying to get to to make sure that we can steal third. But either way, we don't do a lot of stealing flat-footed. Now, if the pitcher, like let's say you're playing in a high school game and the pitcher is a 1-8 to the plate and the catcher's got a 2-2 pop time, well, almost everybody else is going to be able to just straight steal and you're going to be safe every single time. So you also got to know what the pitcher's time to the plate is and the catcher's pop time to know whether even jumping the pitcher is necessary because there's some risks involved in jumping the pitcher. If you jump right when he picks off, um, hopefully they understand the concept of jump forward, I didn't hit it, jump right back. But if it's perfectly timed up, yeah, you're going to get picked off. The thing is, is that for every time that happens, we're going to steal 10 bases. We'll take 10 bags over one you know, pickoff that, that happens over the course of the game you know, every day of the week. So um, just know that there's a risk reward there, but the, the pros, you know, massively outweigh the cons if we do this thing correctly. And what we need you to be on board with is this. If a player makes a mistake trying to be aggressive, you don't discourage the aggressiveness. You can coach them about the situation, but then you need to be, to be you know, really uh, positive with them and saying, but that's okay. We're staying aggressive. I'm glad that you tried it. Let's try it differently this next time around. And I can't wait to watch you, same thing as defense. I can't wait to watch you succeed next time um, so that they don't feel like, hey, we were trying to be aggressive. You, you, I heard you say that, and then I got thrown out, and now you're mad. Well, now I'm never being aggressive again. Don't coach the aggressiveness out of them. Teach them the game if they make a mistake, but always encourage the aggressiveness um, so that we can keep that theme going throughout the academy. Because like I said, we've separated ourselves a little bit, both in-state and, and uh, nationally, um, when we go and play in these tournaments, uh, out-of-state tournaments, um, that we are the, 
by far the most aggressive team on the bases. So we want to keep that up. Um, so as far as the communication of everything goes, what we've told parents regarding communication and how to address issues they may have with the team. Midweek practice schedules for 14U and older, so that's any of your midweek training, 14U and up. All of that communication comes from me. You as the coaches don't need to worry about that. They also don't need to report their attendance to me on that. The 10 to 13 you guys, you have midweek team practices, which means you can let them know about that. They should know by now, but you can let them know about that, and, um, and then they can report back to you about whether or not they will be there. Um, so there's a little bit of a difference between the two ages, just given the, the kind of the type of practice that takes place. So 10 to 13 you has midweek team practices. So it's a little bit more important that they report to you as the head coach um, about whether you're going to be there so you can build a practice plan accordingly. We don't need to know about any midweek conflicts from any of the players. We only need to know about game conflicts. And I've sent a bunch of emails out to parents and has gotten a res uh, response from all of them about um, about their availability for the fall and any conflicts they have. And then I will pass that along to you once everybody has gotten back to me so you know kind of what you're looking at um, for, for any conflicts and what the roster size and who, who will be there on Friday, Saturday, Sunday of any tournament that you play in. So if, the, if they're going to miss a game or a tournament, they need to let me know and you know both, and that's what's been communicated um, to the parents. Any, uh, any playing time conflicts, like they want to talk about why is my son not playing shortstop more, they've been told to take that up with you directly they've also been told that there's a 24-hour rule okay so 24-hour rule is really important it allows everybody to calm down we're not allowing anybody to approach you in the parking lot you know all hot about whatever okay they have to wait and if anybody does try to approach you all you got to say is hey there's a 24-hour rule on this we're not talking about it right now and i don't care at that point honestly how mad they are they know they've been told they've signed off on this um, so at that point in time, you're just sticking to our to our guns on that, and uh, and we'd be happy to back you in any way, um, assuming that you have followed the guidelines that I've set in place for you about playing time. If you if you follow what I just talked about with playing time expectations, we will always have your back. If you don't, we might have to talk about you know with you about what's what's going on with um, with the playing time and, and and stuff like that. But if you do follow those things. We'll always have your back, um, so if you need to get us involved in any way with any parent conflicts, um, let us know. But otherwise, anything about playing time and things like that, um, they've been told to, to reach out to you about that. Um, they will also be hearing from you about pre- and post-weekend emails, um, which is the next thing I want to talk about. Pre-weekend emails come out, you know, hopefully the, either the day of or the day after the tournament schedule being released for that upcoming weekend. Okay, so um, what's included in a pre-weekend email is almost 100% logistical. All right, there's, there's not a lot of like, you know, hey, I'm looking to improve on this or whatever. That's for the post-weekend email. Pre-weekend email is almost 100% logistical. I will send this out in an email with this uh, as well, but here's what goes into a pre-weekend email. Game time and opponent. Arrival time that the player will be at the field. Now, your two options for arrival time is either one hour before the game or an hour and 15 minutes before the game. More than an hour and 15 minutes before the game is just not necessary. You'll probably have a lot of standing around and we don't really want that. We wanna minimize that as much as we can. And nothing less than an hour is really appropriate. Um, and so we wanna make sure that, that they're there in plenty of time to not feel rushed. So don't have it be less than an hour, but an hour, more than an hour and 15 minutes is probably not necessary. So those are kind of your two options, either an hour or hour 15 minutes before the game. A field location that is hyperlinked to a Google Map location of the field. Okay, so this would just be above and beyond communication on your part. Obviously, you could just name the field, and 99% of the time, uh, a parent or a grandparent is going to be able to type that in and get to the right spot. You probably won't get burned on it, but the one time that you do, you're really going to wish that you hyperlinked. So you you, you know you slide over on the email, click hyperlink, and you've gone to a Google Maps um, location of the field copied that URL, pasted it into the hyperlink in the email so that all they have to do is click on that and their Google Maps open up and they can go right to the field from there. That makes it really easy on the, the parents. 
So field location that is hyperlinked to a Google map location of the field, and then also the field address as well um, with that in a pre-weekend email. So the, the pool play schedule will always be very straightforward. You'll be able to say exactly when, where, what time to be there, all that stuff. Um, explanation of bracket play in there. So all you have to do basically with that, because there's so many variables, is like, are we guaranteed to make bracket play or not? And if we do make bracket play, what time does what what's the earliest that could start? And if there's a bunch of different field locations, you can just say, well, wait and see. If there's only one field location that the entire bracket is taking you to, you can put in that email, hey, the entire uh, bracket play that we would get into, um, that's all at blank blank field. And here's another hyperlink. But obviously, the the location or the, the uh, uh, time and opponent is still t uh, to be determined based on how pool play um, shakes out. And then obviously there's some tournaments, there's friendship games involved too. So if you don't get your game guarantee in pool play, there'll be friendship games. And you can kind of, if you want to get into all the different options there, you can. Again, most people understand, like, I don't know about Sunday yet or I don't know about bracket play yet um, because we haven't shaken this whole thing out. People do understand that. But if you could explain to them just the general format of that, that would be awesome. Um, rules for the tournament, including a link to the rules page if you'd like. Um, sorry. Uh, including a, a link to the rules page if you'd like. Do not rely on them to read the rules that they need to know. So, for example, if in the rule sheet it says it's a wood bat tournament, don't just send the rules out and expect them to read it. You need to then put this is a wood bat tournament or um, this is th the whole tournament's played on this complex, and at that complex, there's no metal spikes. You you have to explicitly write that in your pre-weekend email. If you depend on them to do it, I guarantee you, there will be 25 percent of your team that will show up with the wrong things and not understand what to do. It's just the reality of it. Um, as frustrating as that is, you do need to do the extra work of getting them any rules that they need to know about. You don't have to tell them about any pitch rules that exist in the tournament. You don't have to tell them about um, roster stuff, like can you bat the whole roster or not or whatever. Like You don't have to tell them about any of that because that's stuff that only you need to know as the coach. But anything that pertains to what they need to bring or any rules that, that affect parents and the players prep for the tournament, that needs to be written in the email as well. Um, a link to the schedule page to allow them to follow along. So one of the common ways for a lot of tournaments is called tourney machine. Um, and you can link the tourney machine uh, hyperlink into the email so that they can follow along with what your team is and, and kind of any scheduling updates for, um, for the entire weekend. Last thing is uh, putting your direct cell phone number in there I think is a good thing because anything that happens last minute where you may not be able to check your email, they will be able to text you, hey, um, there's a road closure on whatever, we're running 10 minutes late. Obviously, we'd love it if that never happened, but any last minute things, your cell phone number will be the best way to get a hold of you. So if you, if you wouldn't mind putting your cell phone number out to the parents, that would be, that would be awesome. One thing to make, so that, that's it as far as the content of pre-weekend emails. One thing to make it easier to do the pre-weekend emails is creating a, a really easy drag and drop list of, um, of the emails so that you know that, hey, I just drag it from my computer and I put it into my Gmail or whatever I use and it, it'll all go into that and then you can write from there. So um, always make sure you're blind copying your email address as a parent. Do not go don't don't put it in the two column or the two um, box the blind copy box is where you put all the emails for the parents when you're sending when you're sending that out to them so on the computer it should be pretty easy to just copy and paste into any platform on the phone if you want to do that from your phone um, a couple things that that I've noticed so first of all creating a, a Google Doc of your um, parent email list you can just drag from the Google Doc app that you have on your phone and put it into your email. However, Gmail, I don't know if it works for Outlook Mail or any of the other different platforms, but Gmail specifically, it does not populate correctly um, from my understanding and from what I've tried. It does not populate correctly into Gmail, so that won't work. The Apple Mail app that comes with your iPhone, if you have an iPhone, 
it does populate correctly into that. So getting your um, whatever email address you're using for the fall into that app on Apple um, Mail will, ha will help you be able to send the email out really easily because you can drag and drop from your Google Doc into the Apple uh, Mail. If you're an Android user, I don't know what that looks like for you guys um, as far as your standard, your standard mail app. Um, or if it's an Outlook email or any you know, Yahoo email, any other app that you have on your phone, I haven't tried all of them. But just know that I know for sure the Apple Mail app um, is the one that for sure does work uh, with, with being able to use it if you want to send out a, uh, any, any email of any kind with a drag and drop from your phone. Um, okay, let's talk about pregame routine. So like I said, they're there an hour to an hour and 15 minutes before um, the game. You do not need to have a warm up for them that matches what we do on Tuesday nights or matches what you do, you know, what we have as an academy warm up. We don't have a standard academy active warm up per se. I know that we'll do the same thing every day at, on Tuesday nights at academy practice um, for the 14 to 18 year olds. But again, you don't necessarily need to follow that. What I do want you to have for sure is something that is consistent. So the first couple times you do it, um, you're going to need to lead it. And then if you want to have players lead it after that, you, sh you should still be out in the outfield with them so that you know that they're getting a good warm-up in, a good active warm-up in every single time. And I would just ask that it's something that's consistent. It shouldn't take 20 minutes to warm up their bodies. Um, we'll talk about throwing in a second. It should take five to seven, in my opinion. Um, that way, no matter what the situation is, okay, you're waiting for somebody else to get off the field with the game before you, you don't have a ton of time, you should have five to seven minutes. That's, that should be something that you should have. Um, and at the very least, you should do it off to the side of the field if there's space, um, so that the only thing you need to do when you get on the field is throw. Before they throw, it would be a, a J-band routine. Um, they're getting a pretty good J-band routine from us, both at practice and uh, on Tuesday night practices as well as the youth practices. Um, so you should have that. If you don't know what a, a, the Jager band, different exercises that you can do to have them warm up their shoulder, um, please do reach out and ask. We'd be happy to get that to you. After they do Jager bands, it's a throwing routine. So again, this, kind of, this goes back to um, you do not need to have a, a full... Um, throwing routine that matches what we do necessarily on, on Tuesday nights or at your youth practices. It doesn't need to necessarily match that, but it does need to be the same thing every single time so there's predictability with what they do. The worst thing that you can do, in my opinion, as a coach is so you're, let's say you get into your dugout an hour before the game and you say, all right, go warm up your body and your arms and I'll see you in 20 minutes. Okay, there's going to be a bunch of guys that don't do enough. There's going to be a bunch of guys that do too much. There's going to be a bunch of guys that are, don't really take their throwing very seriously because they're just trying to see if they can loosen up their shoulder and they're making bad throws all over the place because there's no structure and there's no focus to it. Some sort of structure for your active warm-up and some sort of structure for your throwing routine is all that we ask. That way it's a concentrated effort on both of those things before the game, before the game takes place. So again, it doesn't need to match what we do, but something that's consistent um, every single pregame. Is, is what we're looking for. Obviously, the other aspect of pregame is hitting. This varies so much what your availability is going to be. Some fields do not have any cages, and if you're an older guy, you can't obviously be hitting. You know, you know, maybe we'll have the weighted balls that they can hit. If you're an older guy, you may just not be able to hit. An older um, player, you may just not be able to hit before the game. It is what it is. Younger guys, if you have um, wiffle balls or weighted balls or whatever that you want to hit with your team if there's no cages. You find some space in the outfield and you go do that. So if there is cages available, um, that obviously changes things. I would recommend you know, a round of eight and a round of six. At most, two rounds of eight. Um, I've done as little as one round of eight, depending on the time and kind of what the feel is. Um, you, you're not trying to give them a hitting lesson before the game. You're trying to get them to see a moving baseball as best they can, feel good about themselves when they leave, leave the cage, and that's pretty much it. And then obviously loosening up all the different hitting muscles that go along with that. So that's the main goal of hitting before the game, not to necessarily make them a better hitter by teaching them things. I believe it's more about seeing a moving baseball, um, 
feeling good, squaring up a few baseballs, getting out of the cage. Okay, good. I'm ready. I'm ready to go to go hit. Okay, that's that's what I believe a pregame hitting thing is. Couple things to maximize your use of time. If you want to have one coach in the outfield doing half of the throwing side of things and one coach in the cage doing half of the hitting, the half the group's hitting, and then flip flop halfway through, you can maximize your time that way. It's a not a great use of time to have everybody waiting at the cage while one guy goes at a time. It does happen from time to time. I mean, there's no doubt. I've definitely done that multiple times, many times. Um, but if you can, for efficiency's sake, have half the group do something else that's active and then switch halfway through um, once the first half that's hitting done hitting in the cage is done. Um, that way you can be efficient with it. One thing that I always do that I recommend, your starting pitcher and catcher always hit first. So they those two guys get all of their hitting done. So pitcher hits, or it doesn't matter which one, but pitcher hits, catcher hits, pitcher gets his second round, catcher gets his second round, they're done. That way the only thing they have to worry about between there and game time is getting ready to pitch. So your pitcher and catcher go first. I would also recommend that you don't go your entire roster through round one and your entire roster through round two if you have everybody at the cage. Break it up into groups of two or three. So the pitcher catcher is a group of two. If you want another group of two or another group of three, however you want to make that math work out, that way they know that once they get out of the cage after round one, they're hitting again in like, you know, a couple minutes. They're, they don't have to wait for the entire group to go again. And then once those two or three are done, you send them over to the field. Okay, next two or three are ready to go. And so you kind of segment it in hitting groups like that as opposed to the entire roster um, waiting to get to get their, their cuts in. Last thing that happens pregame is their mental journals. Um, we'll leave this a little bit up to you as far as what you want a mental journal to, to be talking about that day. I know for me, like just an example of it, on Friday and Saturday um, for games this summer, I talked about, you know, our first game of the weekend was, okay, you know, tell me again what we talked about after last weekend. So they write down what we talked about after the previous weekend, what we need to improve on, and then a specific plan for attacking that in game one to make improvements from what happened the previous weekend. So that'd be game one. Game two, you know, again, it can be what's what's my goal today? What do I what do I want to accomplish? Um, tell me about a two strike approach that you have. Something that gets them to explicitly think about it and write it down. For me, this summer on Sundays, whether it was the travel situation or staying nights at hotels, if you're a travel, you know, the, if you are on the road, Sundays was, hey, the energy today has to be a choice. You have to choose energy today, okay? So Sundays was a lot about our energy and our focus and making sure that that stays on par with Friday and Saturday because that those days were usually great on that. Sundays gets a little bit more of a drag. Um, it's getaway day. They had to pack up all their stuff, get out of the hotel, whatever. Um, it's just been a long weekend. So fr uh, Sundays was all about, hey, today I'm going to choose energy. What can I do today to make sure I'm being a great teammate and communicating constantly? Because when energy goes down, communication goes down. Communication with your teammates is, and coaches is, is huge. So whatever you want your mental journal to accomplish for you, you just gather them all around at the same time. Tell them to take a knee. Tell them to get out their mental journals. And you can kind of put some focus points out there for them. Also allowing them to have some autonomy with it too. Saying something like, what is your goal for the day is a perfectly acceptable question. They have to really think about it and they have to write it down. You're not always telling them what to write down. You are guiding their thoughts towards some autonomy that takes place after that. So that's the goal of a mental journal. It gets them really focused on what they're trying to do um, and what their plan is for the day. Okay, so that's enough about the pregame routine. Game changer. Um, game changer is just a way for you to track in-game things. So like uh, what's he at for a pitch count? What's the score? Things that you know might not always have a scoreboard um, on and you can ask a parent about. Most parents are familiar at least to some level with what Game Changer is. And hopefully you have a parent on your team or two or three that will volunteer to do Game Changer on a rotating basis or somebody does it all the time, whatever. So hopefully you're able to identify who that is that's willing to do Game Changer. Um, and then you need to get them a lineup before the game um, so that they have that and they can start entering things into Game Changer for for you. It also allows us to compile some stats over the course of the season. Um, we, we don't do like the stat chasing thing. Um, I don't care about 
who hit 350 versus 290. Um, there's a lot of different variables that go into that, but it does allow us to track generally what the stats were um, throughout the course of the fall. Um, if you have any specific questions about Game Changer, if you're a 10 to 14 U coach, ask Tim. If you're a 15 to 18 U coach, ask Matt. They know more about Game Changer, honestly, than what I do. Um, they've used it for a little bit longer, so they can, can keep you up to date um, with all that you need to, to know about Game Changer. Things that will be given to you. Buckets of baseballs will be given to you. Um, lineup cards will be given to you. So um, the other part of, I talked about the roster, or the, the lineup for defensive positioning. She, we already talked about that. This is our lineup card. You'll be, you'll be given a bunch of these as well. Um, a red folder will be given to you um, that has all of this in it. So you'll be, you'll be given all that. And then a bucket of baseball, baseballs will be given to you. Some of those, game, the, those baseballs in there will be game balls. Depending on the tournament that we play in, some of you may need to provide two to three game balls per game. So you need to make sure that you're not beating up your pearls that are in your bucket, because um, not all of them will be pearls, but you need to make sure that you're not beating those up too badly to be able to use in a game. In fact, it would probably be good if you just say, okay, we're never hitting or throwing with these. They're just at the bottom of my bucket so that when, some, when a, a tournament comes around that I need two or three of those per, I can just hand those per game um, and you'll be good to go. We do obviously do have more uh, more game balls at the facility. If you do run out, that's awesome. But if you run out after one weekend, we're gonna ask you why that happened, okay? It should take you almost all the way through the fall. If you do run out, don't be afraid to ask. We want you to be able to have enough uh, game balls. Um, and then the rest of your bucket will be either used baseballs or we have like baseballs that hold up a little bit longer. Um, that are technically for machines. We may put some of those in there because they're perfectly good to use no matter what, but they don't get like waterlogged on wet grass. They don't do anything like that. The covering is a little bit different. Um, and to be honest, if hearing me say that, any of those that I've seen before I saw this specific baseball I'm talking about, I would have laughed and said, so you're talking about a baseball that's terrible. I'm actually not talking about a baseball that's terrible. It's a really good baseball um, that just has a little bit of a different covering on it so that if you do hit a baseball on a wet grass, because it's, it's a 9 a.m. game and you had to get there at, at 8 and they're still due on the grass, by the, you know, two hours into the game, you're going to be like, oh, this is a perfectly dry baseball that feels just like it did before. If you do that with regular baseballs, they're going to be soggy, wet, potentially waterlogged. So this, this uh, type of baseball I'm talking about just allows you to, to be able to, uh, it, it holds up a little bit better over the course of the season. So... Red folder with all the stuff um, in it will be given to you. Bucket of baseballs will be given to you. You'll need to supply a fungo um, and if uh, stopwatch and things like that. All of that will be um, on you to supply. Um, if you do need a stopwatch, we do have some extra ones, but we don't have enough for everybody. So if you have a stopwatch, we'd prefer it if you would supply that. Um, and then you'll be given uh, a BP top uh, and a red shirt and a black hat. Most of you already have all that stuff. so. Um, but just know that, that that's, that's an expectation that, that that's what you're wearing. And so we'll give you all that stuff as well. Specifically what to wear every game. If you're a 10 to 12 U coach, you can coach in black shorts or black pants. Um, if you'd like the red BP top or red, uh, great lakes t-shirt either or, or both is still what you have to wear up top. And then black hat is still what you have to wear up top. But you, as a 10, 11, or 12 U coach, can coach in black shorts and black pants if you'd like. 13 through 18 U, you have to be in white baseball pants. Plain white baseball pants um, is, what we, is what we want you to coach in. If you do have one black stripe down the side, that is acceptable. We would like it if it was plain white pants. Um, so if you're like, the only pants I have right now and I don't want to go buy a new pair is one with one black stripe down the side, cool, no worries. Um, but if you're like, I'm looking at two pairs of pants right now. I got to buy a new one. One's plain white, one's with black stripe. We really, really want the plain white. That's what we've said this, uh, to the parents as well, is that we, we want it to be plain white. We highly, highly encourage it to be a plain white pair of pants. So that's the 13 to 18 you got to wear baseball pants. Um, BP top, if you'd like, for sure, red shirt, um, red Great Lakes shirt specifically, and then black hat um, is what to wear to every single game. So... That's all that I have. I know that covered a lot. Thanks for taking 40 minutes of your time. Um, I know that that's, that's, def, that's not nothing. I mean, you gotta carve that out and I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Um, thank you so much for all that you're gonna do this fall. 
Thanks for all the positivity, energy, teaching, like I talked about at the beginning, that you're going to bring to every single game because I know that that's super easy when things are going well. Not every game this fall is going to go well. All right, You're going to have some rough ones, whether it's rough like you lost by three but you've been winning every game you played, or rough like back end of a doubleheader, we lost by five the first game and now we're down by six in the second inning of the second game. That happens. Please relentlessly give positivity, relentlessly teach, relentlessly give energy because um, that's going to ultimately su sustain us through the entire thing um, no matter what. So it's super easy when things are going well, but please know that, that we need it from you. We need it from you when it's not going well as well, and we thank you ahead of time for being willing to do that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll send this in a, a uh, an email with an example of a pre-weekend email as well um, so that you can have that. Um, just kind of see what that format looks like. Um, and those are the two things you're going to get from me. And then, like I said, we'll get you a bucket of baseballs. We'll get you a red folder all before your first game. Um, and I, we may rely on you to hand out jerseys as well, depending on the team. Um, so just look for some communication from me directly on that to you about what the situation is for your team. Some of the teams are getting entirely new uniform sets. Some teams it's just fillers. Um, some teams have rosters that have pretty much everybody that already has a jersey and everything in between. So look for individual communication with me on that for, uh, as far as what your jersey situation is. Otherwise, I think that's all I got. Thank you so much, guys. Have an awesome rest of your day.